So as the, this workshop shows, robot learning is, uh, is indeed becoming uh, an increasingly important topic. And I've been looking at this topic in the recent year from uh, particular robotics, uh, where basically the central target uh, in the long term is to be able to build robots which, once they are out of the factory in a way, arrived in the wild, uh, in, for example in the homes, would be capable of learning by themselves or through interaction with humans a variety of skills and know-how that were not specified uh, in details by the designer. Uh, and basically this is exactly what human children and humans in general do. And as they are, they are probably the, one of the only creatures in the, wo in the world to do that, um, our methodological approach is to try to figure out what kind of ideas and mechanisms we could import from developmental psychology, developmental neuroscience, um, and those related fields. Um, so coming back to the topic of robot learning, I'd like to talk about um, uh, what I call the challenges of exploration. Uh, so of course when you talk about robot learning, um, an important research challenge is to develop powerful um, statistical inference mechanisms for building world models, for learning sensory motor control policies, policies from, from training data or, or from re rewards. But there are also very other very important research issues. Uh, another, one, another one is, for example, uh, understanding what kind of training data one should consider, how uh, this training data should be encoded or represented, and extremely important, importantly, how it should be or could be collected. Because actually, the training data, its nature, and the way it's collected also impacts completely the, the very nature of the problem we are trying to solve. Um, and indeed with robots, most typically training data is going to be collected by the robot itself, uh, either through self-experimentation or through learning by observation. And it's not an engineer which we expect to, to prepare a clean uh, training data set who will feed it to the robot. And so how is the robot going to, to, to collect this training data? And the big problem, is that in real world robots, especially if we take the developmental robotics um, um, target in which we would like the robot to be able to, to learn um, a variety of motor skills, the sensory motor spaces are going to be huge. Like the, the only uh, the set of motor skills you can learn with, with your own body composed of um, hundreds of muscles um, is, uh, is something which is much, much, much higher than what is, is physically possible in the lifetime, in your own lifetime. So I don't even and talk about what you can do with external objects. And this is not uh, only when you consider uh, various kinds of activities, but even a single kind, like just playing tennis. Actually, you can learn the, 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 the set of things you can learn to do with a tennis racket and a tennis ball is, is so large that you could practice all your life and there would still be an infinite number of things you could do with those two things and you would not have time to learn it. Even Roger, Roger Federer would not have enough time during all its life to learn everything. So the question is how do you explore the world in order to, le to learn at least correctly a, f a, f a, f a reasonable collection of motor skills? So obviously, random exploration will fail. So there are various strategies you can ma imagine to, to, to uh, to consider this problem. First strategy is to try to do as much as you can to avoid the need for exploration. And actually, when you want a robot to learn a specific task that you know beforehand, such as, for example, a, 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 a legged robot for which you wanted to learn a, a gait policy for learning to walk forward uh, at maximum speed, and thus you, you can design a specific reward function, and when you allow yourself to make certain uh, assumptions on the analytic form of the policies um, and of the reward functions you are going to use, then in that case, you can find elegant mathematical um, workarounds uh, that allow you to compute, for example, robustly gradients from uh, not so many data, uh, and thus actually learn complex, uh, well, non-trivial skills uh, without too much the need for exploration. But in the end, if you want really to um, um, to learn a um, uh, 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 more diverse and more complex set of skills, you will not anyway escape exploration. And by the way, those assumptions are not always desirable. Um, especially uh, when you are interested in learning not only uh, one uh, task such as a robot uh, walking forward at maximum speed, but you would like the robot to learn all kinds of translations and rotation it can do with its body. 
Here, you don't have a well-defined specific reward function, for, for example. Um, in, in that kind of case, or, or when you want to learn a variety of motor skills, like you wouldn't only want the robot to learn walking, but also navigating, shooting in balls, whatever. And, and when also you would not like to be too much constrained by the kind of um, properties that you would need to encode motor primitives, for example, then sensory motor space spaces become even bigger and so you cannot escape exploration. So there is no secret, you need constraints on exploration so that you are able to learn anything at all. And it is interesting to look at the human child because indeed the human child learns, is able to learn many things which are not encoded of course in its genome but at the same time it does not start from nothing. Uh, learning from nothing is of course impossible. It is equipped with a, with a number of um, mechanisms which are going to be crucial for him. Uh, for example, it has innate uh, motivational systems which pushes it to, to spontaneously explore sensory motor activities, but in a pretty organized manner. I will come back to that, and it's related to active learning. Second, the, the child comes to the world uh, uh, equipped with uh, sensory motor primitives, which makes that it's not going to um, explore the world and its own body by controlling individually all its muscles, one by one, and, gen and, and, fi and generate movements pixel by pixel, if you want, but it's equipped with uh, neural systems who encode synergies of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of muscle activations, which corresponds basically to dynamical systems, which then are controlled by relatively little um, uh, um, uh, little input uh, stimuli. Uh, it has some, uh, some, some, some reflex, complete, complete loops, such as, for example, a, a, a baby that, that's born, you put something in the, in the palm and it closes its, its, all its fingers, and closing all its fingers is a complex coordination of, the, of all the fingers. So we have a repertoire of these things. And of course, also the body, the very body, and the morphology of the, of the baby is not at all random. And uh, we are going to see how it can help. And second thing is that all these innate constraints and mechanisms, they, they, they do not arrive uh, at one time just the day of the birth. They just, they unfold progressively with specific properties in the way they unfold progressively, which again can, 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 can provide constraints. And I'm going to come back on that later on. Um, so then our goal is to understand how based, how those constraints can allow learning mechanisms to actually uh, um, provide the child the ability to acquire an open-ended set of skills. So, of course, um, an obvious, very important uh, constraint on exploration is social guidance. We learn a lot by learning, by imitation, observation. But uh, it's not difficult for you, I think, to, to understand that even if you observe all your life Roger Federer play tennis uh, and, and you sit in a chair, then you, it won't even lead you to an intermediate level of playing tennis. You need to practice also tennis yourself. You need to explore yourself with your own body, this sensory motor space. And actually, um, so of course, and indeed, um, social learning, while being essential and important, is not the only way uh, children acquire new skills. They also do that by spontaneous, autonomous explorations. Um, uh, psychologists have actually studied a lot of spontaneous exploration in children, and they did find that uh, uh, many kind of exploratory behavior cannot only be explained by basic motivations such as finding food, find, uh, having sleep, etc., etc. Some of them seems to be uh, so, uh, looking like uh, the uh, mechanism that push in front to experiment new activities for, the, for their own sake, like what we would call in a colloquial, colloquial manner curiosity. And Actually, uh, in our context, it can be, uh, it corresponds to, it can be modeled um, pretty, pretty well um, in, in, uh, in the context of uh, reinforcement learning, in what we call intrinsically motivated reinforcement learning, but which is a variation, uh, a, 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 value, a, a different but, um, uh, formulation of the same thing uh, which, which exists as active learning or optimal experiment design, which was already uh, a flowing field in the 70s with people like Fedorov. Uh, and so basically, uh, in many um, learning situations, you need to learn a mapping, which can be in robotics, for example, uh, uh, from, state, uh, from space X, typically the Cartesian product of the state and the action from space Y. And, uh, and so you, are, you have a, um, um, uh, typically um, a, a reward function also, which, you, which and, so, and basically you want to build a model of this function. And you can introduce 
um, a mechanism which is going to allow you to choose optimally the next, um, uh, the next action to do such that the sampling, the, the problem of the environment that you will do will provide you a, a maximum gain of, in, of information. So basically this can be technically formulated as a very classical reinforcement learning um, framework where the reward here is going to be something related to information gain. Um, and actually, there, is, there has been a lot of work uh, um, uh, in the literature already in the 70s, but more recently in the field, for example, of, uh, um, uh, of, of reinforcement learning and, and active learning, where various people have investigated what kind of measures of interestingness related to information gain we could use to efficiently lead such a curiosity-driven learning system to acquire efficiently world models um, uh, so, for example, criteria like uh, searching for places where we have little data, places where prediction errors are high, places where the variance is maximal, places where entropy is maximal, etc., etc. And they have, this kind of heuristics has been proven to be extremely efficient in a number of applications. But in robotics, uh, um, when applied, especially in, uh, in, 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 in the, the developmental framework I, I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, they are a bit problematic because actually they make um, several underlying assumptions quite often. Uh, most often they, they assume that it is actually possible to learn a complete model of the world during the lifetime of the learning agent. And so the, the question is how to learn this complete model in the minimal number of experiments. But there is this assumption. Also, it is all often assumed that the world is learnable everywhere. Uh, and finally, it is less an important assumption, but it is still, uh, it's often assumed that noise is rather homoge homogeneous. And actually, in most uh, real world uh, non-toy sensory motor uh, robotic spaces, uh, those three assumptions are, do not hold. Um, and actually, it will, it, will pro it will lead to very strange behavior in a robot. So you put a robot in a, in a room uh, with, uh, for example, visual sensors, and it can, it can move around, maybe it has arms, and you, put the, and, and you equip it with the community-driven learning system where the interest, interestingness function is, for example, look for um, um, part of the sensory motor space where prediction errors are maximally, maximally high. What you will get is the robot, uh, for example, stopping at the window and looking outside at the window and then just do nothing else during the day and when you inspect what's happening within the robot, actually it's trying to predict what's going to be the size of the next cloud coming through the window, which of course is something which is completely uh, unpredictable and so there, it makes a lot of prediction errors. It's very novel. So the pure search for novelty will provoke um, very strange behavior in robots. Uh, actually, psychologists when, and, and, and neuroscientists, when, when uh, um, studying uh, curiosity-driven learning in humans, they found that um, uh, the pure search of novelty was not really what was at play in the human brain. Rather, it seems that, it seems that the human brain is intrinsically interested in situations of intermediate complexity. Those that are a bit more complicated than what is already mastered, so those things that are not trivial, but, al but also not too complicated such that they can be actually mastered or learned. Uh, and actually, this uh, uh, notion of intermediate complexity uh, has been approached by an idea that I have explored in the recent years and that have also been uh, independently explored already in the 90s by Jürgen Schmidhuber, which is basically to model interestingness as um, uh, parts of the sensory motor space where the model you are trying to build improves maximally fast. So basically it's the derivative of the prediction errors that you are looking for. And typically the architecture we have been building consists of a normal uh, predictor uh, which, given the sensory motor flow and actions, try to predict uh, what's going to happen next, and this can be a Gaussian process, a support vector machine, or whatever. And then you put uh, at a higher level a meta predictor, which basically consists in two mechanisms: one which splits the space into various regions, and in each, each of these regions, there is a mechanism that's going to monitor how, uh, what is the evolution of prediction errors. And basically, when you explore a region uh, corresponding to, to, to a particular evolution of prediction error, you get rewards that correspond to the derivative um, of uh, the inverse of the derivative of, of, this, of, the, of, this, um, of this measure. 
Uh, I'm not going to enter too much into the detail because, uh, because I have been told that I should uh, have my talk uh, rather short. Um, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm just going to, to, to skip those slides um, and basically show you that what, what, what this kind of measure, instead of using things such as look for maximal uncertainty or, or novelty, should, should provide. So imagine, so it is a very simple um, example to understand what's happening. So this is a, um, a robot with two degrees of freedom and a one pixel camera put in this room where there are several white walls one wall with this pattern, and on the top wall, it's, it's random noise. And so, um, because it is, there are two degrees of freedom and one pixel, we can represent the whole sensory motor space into this picture. And the fact that you see twice this uh, pattern is because there is this shape which makes that the robot is redundant. And so basically, you want to build a model of this world. And of course, if you use the, the heuristics that push you to explore the part of the sensory motor space where your predictions or entropy is maximal, you will, you will get on the top. You will, you will focus all the time on, 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 on things which are not predictable. Uh, if you use the kind of, of measures we've been developing, what you will see is that progressively, the system will discover that there are these so time is going from one, two, three, and, and this is the, the percentage of, 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 the, of time that systems spend in, observe, in observing various parts of the space. And it will discover that they are, and spend more time in those interesting parts of the space, and if you zoom in, actually, in one of these, of these zones, you actually see that first the system focuses on the simple zones and progressively uh, focuses on the more and more complicated zones. So it's a way to automatically master the growth of complexity. Um, Actually, even those kind of algorithms, they have a problem when you try uh, uh, to, to apply them in high dimensional spaces. Um, because actually, they are, they are, as I said, framed in a reinforcement learning framework. And as in any reinforcement learning framework, you have an exploitation exploration dilemma. And so here, because this very algorithm is an exploration, algor is an exploration method, so basically it means that you have a meta-exploitation, meta meta-exploration dilemma. And in, in, it, which means that basically, before focusing on zones which are interesting and avoiding those, those which are not interesting, you still need to make a little bit of measures, even in those zones which are not interesting, to, to know that they are not interesting. And this becomes, of course, infeasible uh, when spaces, the size of spaces uh, increase. So basically, you need some constraints. Um, so I will skip this part of my talk, uh, which is basically um, uh, some, some later version of these systems, where actually we use the property that in many uh, robotic spaces, actually, you can identify a task space or an operational space and um, a common space where the operational space, such as, for example, um, a torso where uh, a robot can, can, can move like this, and where the task most often consists in trying to do things with the hands, which is controlled by the whole body. And basically, the, the, the dimensionality of the space in which the hands move uh, is, is much smaller than the control dimensionality. And actually, you can do active learning, not not for learning the forward model and so in the space of the joints, but you can do active learning by, uh, at the higher level by choosing actually goals in the operational space and thus spanning dynamically new reinforcement learning problems uh, corresponding to those goals and then uh, for each of those goals span a lower level, more traditional uh, active learning algorithm such as the one I presented before. In those cases, of course, you reduce the dimensionality and this can be much more efficient. Uh, okay. Uh, Sorry to interrupt, I know you're under time pressure, but, <laughs> but your hypothesis is that the, the child is actually optimizing, you know, something. And we're just, you've constructed something that tries to match what you think the child is optimizing. They might be choosing that top level completely randomly and just doing the optimization of the interesting with respect to that. That would solve your meta problem and avoid this top level. Do you have any evidence to suggest that children are actually optimizing all the way through? No, 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 no. Um, I'm not saying that. Uh, this is not the hypothesis. I'm, I, I mean, I, I don't claim that this is that. I, as you rightly say, this is an hypothesis. And uh, by definition, an hypothesis must be explored. So indeed, we explore it, and actually we discover that there are limits. And actually, the main message I want to, to make in this talk, but actually I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I will manage to make it, is that we need to introduce some other constraints uh, um, which are typically developmental constraints which will enable those ac active learning algorithms which are already better than random exploration to really work in the real world. Several kinds of constraints. Motor primitives. Um, actually, uh, as I said, um, 
Infants are equipped with dynamical neural systems which allow to control their body uh, by actually not, not, uh, not setting so high dimensional um, uh, commons. Um, and, um, and basically this is a way it, it can reduce the dimensionality of, 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 uh, of problems. And related to that, not only the, 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 the spaces in which they live is very much constrained by, the, by those mo motor synergies, but as I said, the, the, the number of degrees of freedom that are available to them increase with time. So for example, the child first has available the muscles that allow to control the, 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 this part of the body, and then it is going down progressively to the feet, and then from the, the shoulder to the hand. This is called the cortical spinal law um, in uh, developmental neuroscience. And actually, this is a way to maturationally constrain the growth of the number of degrees of freedom. And this is something we can model. So this is something, I'm not going to, to describe you the equations, but this is something we have, uh, we have been doing, uh, the, the providing mathematical model of this growth. And actually, what is interesting is that maturation is not something with an absolute clock, biological clock, but with some kind of, of, um, um, uh, uh, of, of maturational clock which is triggered by those active learning measures that I presented below. Basically, uh, those measures that detect that there is learning progress um, um, uh, happening uh, in the building of the model can trigger the release of new degrees of freedom, can also trigger the increase of the volumes of the, of the different sensory motor spaces available, and can also trigger things such as uh, Increasing the resolution of the sensory of the sensors uh, also increases the, 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 the time resolution of the motor impulses you can send to the commands. So all this begins very simple, and as mastery is increasing, then the space progressively grow. Uh, we've done simple experiments, for example, for learning how to walk um, in a quadruped robot, where we have equipped this robot with motor primitives, which are basically oscillators in, in, in the different legs, um, and then uh, also maturational law, such that it's going to, to have initially a very small volume to explore, and this volume will grow as mastery is going to, to increase. Um, uh, those who are interested can come to, to see me af, af, uh, after the talk, and I can show you a video of this guy, uh, which, which, uh, uh, which is basically um, exploring its, uh, its sensory motor space and looking in very small volume like that, and a bit later on, being able to, to uh, actually not so much later on, in just one afternoon, by curiosity-driven curiosity exploration of this space, constrained by motor primitive and maturational programs, basically is able to, to do all kinds of combination of translations and rotations uh, in the space. And without, at any time, putting a reward function for working forward or backward or whatever. But, but actually, the most interesting video I would like to show you, and I'm concluding on this one, is that one. Uh, the last constraint, which is absolutely essential in humans, especially for learning uh, apparently high dimensional motor skills, uh, such as um, uh, uh, dynamic balancing, uh, biped dynamic balancing or, or, or biped walking, um, uh, is that it's not, in humans, it's not made on a random body. It's made on a body who has particular morphological properties um, uh, and actually we have been designing uh, these robots in, in my lab uh, with um, a number of particular features. So first of all, it has a completely compliant structure intrinsic compliance structure thanks to the materials but also to the fact that there are elastic tendons, springs at uh, many, pla many places. The second thing of this robot is that it is equipped with a vertebral column, unlike uh, you may have noticed most of the existing humanoid robots. But actually it seems that the vertebral column in humans, and it has been confirmed by, by specialists of, uh, of human locomotion, is essential for controlling uh, equilibrium and locomotion. And so this vertebral column, not only is there and is a, is, it can geometrically allow, for example, to control the center of gravity relatively independently from the legs, which make the problem of stabilization much simpler, it is also semi-passive. So basically what is happening here with the arms and with the vertebral column is kind of the same thing that is happening with the legs of passive dynamic workers, except that here it's not the legs that are um, storing uh, potential energy and, and transforming it, transforming it transforming it back into kinetic energy. It is this inverted pendulum and these direct pendulums um, which, which do the job. 
which at the same time allow much rob more robust um, um, uh, um, stabilization as well as um, uh, energy efficiency. And so basically all the, the little behaviors you've seen here, they have been designed with absolutely no model of the dynamics of these robots. But they are not just the result of a smart structure as well as of a smart set of motor primitives which are actually not that complicated, uh, which are basically simple loops from the forces measured in the ankles, which are by the way also, also passives, um, and uh, part of the degrees of freedom are passive, and, and, and the accelerometers in, back into the vertebral column, and basically this working behavior is a, is a self perturbation which is which is absorbed by the by the vertebral column and basically making the, the robot walk in a given in a given direction consists in tuning only two or three parameters of the underlying dynamical systems which in the end make that this robot is already learning being able to learn the to, is already being able to walk uh, uh, dynamically and is robust to perturbations one, without dynamics model, two, without learning. Which means, then, of course, uh, you can learn, uh, 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 this robot here, is, is, he doesn't know how, how to turn extremely well, how to turn uh, right or, or left extremely well, but learning this will amount to do learning in a very low dimensional space. And this is just thanks to the morphology of this robot. So it means that actually when we consider uh, learning biped walking in a robot like Asimo, it might be a bit as meaningless that learning to drive a car with squared wheels. So which means that when we try to approach learning, we should really be conscious of the context, and in particular the morphological context in which it happens, because it can completely transform the, transform the very nature of the problem we want to solve. So I will conclude here. <laughs>